In an upscale neighborhood in Austin, Texas, a 43-year-old single woman is found strangled. To hear that Diane was no longer alive was a total shock. It's not a typical crime scene. It was eerily clean and eerily undisturbed. And the chilling details begin to pile up. She felt like he was trying to lure her up to her bedroom. She said he turned from a man into a monster. It was horrifying. We finally zeroed in on what the motive was. The climax was actually the murder. Investigators are determined to get to the murderer before he gets his hands on his next victim. We felt like we had a murderer on the loose, and we didn't know when he might kill again. Austin, Texas, where the sun shines nearly 300 days of the year. November 15th, 2001, wasn't one of those days. We begin with some late breaking news. We've seen over 15 inches of rain in just a few hours. Causing tornado warnings for Austin and surrounding areas. Relentless rains and high winds are pounding the streets of Austin. In the northwest suburb of Great Hills, working from the quiet comfort of her home office, is 43-year-old Diane Hollick, a successful IBM project manager who lives the life many single women dream of. She worked hard. She had a beautiful home uh, with a gorgeous pool. She would throw parties. Diane would be going to some of the fanciest restaurants and fanciest dances and balls. But then she put on her cowboy boots and off to one of the local country bars. She'd go from one extreme to the other and fit right in everywhere. Determined to weather the fast approaching storm, Diane continues to work at home as the bad weather hits. We hadn't had rains in maybe five to seven years like that. We had a minimum of 15 tornadoes come through Austin, which is extremely rare. The brutal storm the night before has passed. Leaving in its wake an eerie calm, Diane's friend and local real estate agent, Lackey Brown, does her usual early morning stroll past Diane's house. I walked by her house, and she didn't come out to go for a walk, so I went on. Diane's phone goes unanswered as her colleague at IBM tries to connect with her for their weekly Friday meeting. I called her home number, and I didn't get her uh, to pick up, so I called her cell phone, and then I called her office number, and I left her messages on all three numbers. I knew that she had a lot going on, so I didn't think anything of it. But by early afternoon, Capcar has called eight times from her Dallas office trying to reach Diane. The last thing that um, she told me the night before was, I got to go. My girlfriend says the storm's headed right this way. And then I thought, OK, well, maybe, maybe there was damage at her house. Increasingly worried Diane might have been injured, her colleague contacts police. After the whole day, her not returning any calls, that just wasn't like her. She was more responsible than that. When neighbor Lackey Brown sees the officers arrive at Diane's door that evening, she offers to let them in with her key. She's no more than one step in when she feels a chill run up her spine. The dogs had missed in the dining room, and I said, well, something's wrong. You know, she would never let that happen. Upstairs, they make a grisly discovery. In the bedroom, they find Diane's fully clothed, lifeless body. Austin homicide detectives Eric De Los Santos and Tracy Garish are dispatched to the scene. It was a very beautiful home uh, in a very affluent neighborhood of Northwest Austin. Compared to other crime scenes that I've been to, this is probably the cleanest one I've ever been to. Nothing seems out of place until the investigators reach the bedroom. You had to really physically walk into the room and around the bed to even notice that she was there. She was kind of at an odd angle as if somebody had tried to push her underneath the bed, but she obviously wouldn't fit, so they just left. 
for the investigator's murder isn't the first thing that comes to mind. I thought that the possibility that she committed suicide and a family friend trying to save the, the family from shame or embarrassment, perhaps cleaned up the scene and positioned her in a very respectful manner and, and left her that way. But a closer look at the body reveals a situation far more sinister. On Diane's arms, bruised indentations. They appeared to be left by a zip tie. It's also obvious that she had a very deep ligature mark around her neck. The investigators can come to just one conclusion. We have a murder here, and this person cleaned up the crime scene. Who could have killed Diane Hollick? She trusted everyone, but she trusted this one person a little bit too much. Successful IBM project manager Diane Hollick is found murdered in her high-end North Austin home. We did find uh, the zip tied type injuries. We realized that she probably had been bound. Though there is no evidence of sexual assault. Upon entry into the bedroom, there was makeup and mascara or blood and mascara little droplets right at the entrance of the doorway. It looked like almost that somebody's face had been in that carpet. They also notice a strange marking on her face. She had an abrasion on her cheek that was had that orange yellowish tinge that resembled a rug burn. We figured that was probably a post-mortem injury, possibly from her being dragged. But this pristine crime scene is offering no clues as to who might have done it. That's when something catches Tracy Garish's eye. We saw a towel that was draped over a love seat that was near the front door. And I thought that was very odd. I mean, there was nothing that was out of place except for this towel. It looks like it was a towel that somebody had dried themselves off of and just casually thrown over the, the back of the couch. Investigators bag the towel for analysis, but fear whatever evidence it might offer won't be enough to lead them to Diane's murderer. As far as anything that was obvious and pointed its finger and said, hey, here's your killer, there was nothing in that house. So whoever did this, they spent time in the house, they spent time with the body, they cleaned up the, the crime scene, and then they left. By Saturday morning, Assistant District Attorney Darla Davis joins the investigative team. She was one of those ADAs that you can call up at 2 or 3 in the morning. You can hear her shake the sleep off and then say, OK, what do we got and what do we need to do? Right away, she knew this case was different from the rest. When I first saw the crime scene, it was immaculate. It was pristine. Nothing was out of place. Nothing was disturbed. Did Diane Hollick willingly open the door to her attacker? When you start a homicide investigation, especially when a woman has been killed, you want to start with the men that are closest to her. A free spirit, Diane had no trouble meeting men. We had a great time when we would go out. It never failed. She would meet someone. And we used to laugh about, well, we'll all take her cast stuffs. But Diane had yet to meet the one who would sweep her off her feet, recalls friend and neighbor Donna Hebner. She really wanted to get married. That was the one thing she wanted. She was looking for her right man. She'd meet lots of men, but it wouldn't be the right man and it wouldn't be the right time until Dennis. Dennis treated Diane like a queen. Dennis would show up sometimes with flowers for Diane. He would take her to very nice restaurants and just woo her. And soon Dennis popped the question with a $20,000 platinum engagement ring. One day she came home and we had a girl's dinner, and she was so, so excited about the ring on her finger, she just screamed in the air, I'm engaged. Not all of Diane's friends are thrilled with the news. I didn't care too much for him. Diane's relationship with Dennis was on again, off again. Every relationship has problems, but she didn't let you see it unless you knew her really well. Could Diane's killer be the man she was set to marry? There was some information that received that Perhaps the relationship had gone bad, so that was one of the areas that we were going to concentrate on. Dennis had his ups, he had his downs. Diane had told me of several arguments that they had had on the phone. Diane was very independent. She wanted to make sure she kept her independence as a woman, and that can cause issues between a fiancé and a husband-to-be. Committed to making it work, Diane decides to sell her home so she can move to Houston to be with Dennis. She enlists the help of friend and real estate agent Lackey Brown, but the economy is faltering and the housing market soft. 
We had it on the market for, I guess, about 30 days. Several potential buyers come to tour the house. But we hadn't sold it yet. After multiple failed attempts by police and friends to reach Dennis, some begin to wonder whether he could have had a hand in Diane's murder. Detective Garish had asked me if I thought anyone that Diane knew would do this to her. And I said no. But then she started talking about um, Diane's fiance, Dennis. Might something have pushed him over the edge? You know, he liked to be with Diane by himself, but she was a free spirit. She still did a lot of things with a lot of other people. Including one of her co-workers. He spent more time with Diane than Dennis did. He would walk her dogs. He would feed her dogs if she was out of town. He would just do certain things around the house. He was just doing what he could to be around Diane. Could Diane's relationship with her co-worker have caused Dennis to take drastic measures? Or had her co-worker been rejected one too many times by the woman he worshipped? Then when the workmate suddenly shows up at the crime scene, the investigators are on alert. He seemed overly eager to help us, um, which I thought was odd. That behavior raises red flags in our mind. And it does raise suspicions that this person could possibly be involved. He tells police that when he didn't hear from Diane, he thought he'd come by to check on her, and that he'd been at work on Thursday, the day Diane was killed. It was one thing to have him telling us where he was and telling us that he had not been involved in her murder, but we wanted to get the cold, hard records that would convince us for sure. While Davis issues a subpoena for the co-worker's work records, Tracy Garish makes contact with Dennis Connolly. When he got to Austin, he wanted to go by Diane's house first, but we needed him to come down to the station. We told him we were going to need to get some DNA from him, get some latent fingerprints from him, and also some work documentation that would prove that he was not in Austin at the time. We suspected that she had been murdered. Two men in love with the same woman. Had one of them killed with his own hands in a crime of passion? The devil come knocking on her door, and she paid for it, tragically. It's been 36 hours since the brutal murder of IBM project manager Diane Hollick, and investigators are focusing in on two possible suspects. One was her fiance, Dennis Conley, and the other one, he was a man who was spending quite a bit of time with Diane, even though she was engaged to another man. Whoever killed Diane had left few clues behind and taken something important with them. She was missing a $20,000 engagement ring. When the body was discovered, that ring was not on her hand. Lucky Brown said she never took it off, and we couldn't find it anywhere. Still, police can't be certain robbery was the motive for Diane's murder. This could have been that the perpetrator took some jewelry from her to make it appear to be a robbery and throw us off the scent of the real motive. Detectives bring in Diane's lovesick co-worker for questioning. We thought he could be a suspect at this point. This man bought her roses and expensive gifts. He talked quite a bit about how much he cared for Diane. But Diane did not reciprocate the feelings that this man had. Did she push him over the edge by rejecting his advances one too many times? She did tell me at one point that he probably was too close and needed to be pushed further away. Her thought was that he was infatuated. And sometimes when you get to the point of infatuation, you do need to say, oh, let's stop right here. What's more, the coworker had a key to the victim's home. Despite all of that. I didn't get the sense from him, even though he was overly enthusiastic, that he harbored any anger for her. And towards the end of the interview, for me, I just didn't get that cop feeling that he was going to be the suspect. Her cop feeling turns out to be bang on. We were able to obtain his work records for that Thursday that she was killed, and that confirmed that he was actually at work during the pertinent times. With one suspect crossed off the list, detectives now turn to Diane's fiance. Might things between them have soured to such an extent Dennis killed his bride-to-be? Investigators question him at length. I specifically talked to Dennis about he and Diane's relationship, how they met, how things were going. He offered up that they were both excited about getting married. He was questioned about his whereabouts on the Thursday 
that she was killed. He recounted to us that he had talked to her on the phone that morning, but he did stay in Houston. He was obviously very upset. Uh, couldn't believe that that had happened. But is he telling the truth? We eliminated him through credit card records, through work records. He was actually not in Austin. He was at work during the time the murder happened. Mr. Conley had an airtight alibi for the time of Diane's death. He offered up that he couldn't really think of anybody that she was enemies with that would want to do this to her. So who murdered Diane Hollick? It's been 48 hours since her death, and investigators seem no closer to identifying her killer. We were all feeling a little apprehensive, a little worried. Fear grows in the Great Hills suburb of Northwest Austin. It actually scared us enough that we wouldn't open our door to anyone unless we could see their face and knew who they were. That's when an interview with one of Diane's closest colleagues offers up an important new lead. Diane had told her that a man had come over wanting to possibly buy her house. She told me that the guy was very clean cut looking and that's why she let him in. He seemed well dressed, mid thirties. He had short hair and she was not threatened by his look. He had sold a ranch and that he was looking for a place that he would pay cash for. She seemed uh, excited that he was really interested in it. Diane is overjoyed at the thought of finally selling her home, but her close friend is alarmed at the risk she'd taken. Diane, don't let strangers in your house. The man had indicated to Diane that he was gonna be coming back later with his wife, and he thought that his wife was really gonna love the house. Who is this mystery man? Had he returned to buy Diane's home or take her life? At this point, almost everybody is considered a suspect. So we wanted to talk to him because there was the real possibility that he had been the one that had killed Diane. Investigators now have a suspect. The question is, who is he and how do they find him? At that point, it ups the stakes quite a bit because we believe now that we're looking for a perfect stranger. Austin investigators are under the gun to identify the man who murdered 43-year-old Diane Hollick. If he's done one, he may do it again, and we did not want a second victim. Had the man who toured Diane's home the day of her murder been the one responsible for her death? If so, he may already be on the prowl for fresh prey. And so we decided that we were going to canvas every house in the Great Hills neighborhood that was for sale. The investigators are alarmed by what they find. I believe there are about seven women that have this same story that a man had come to their home the day that Diane was killed and wanted to look at it without a real estate agent. Once we determined that we have a common denominator here, we started getting these women in to come in and give us statements. And Darla Davis observes an eerie pattern. I sat there at the police station and watched them come in one by one, this parade of really beautiful ladies. And they were all about the same age, mid thirties to mid forties. Well, it was starting to get kind of creepy and kind of eerie that this man that had been approaching these women had obviously been targeting them. He was doing this during the day. So there's a lot of women that are stay-at-home moms. And so there wasn't any husbands around. There wasn't any boyfriends around. While most turned him away at the door, one woman felt comfortable enough with a man to let him in. She said he was a very ordinary, plain, sort of looking man. He was between 5'11 and 6 feet tall. His hair was brown, kind of slicked back. Somebody that looked like he came from money. Oblivious to the warning signs, the woman encourages him to tour the house on his own, then immediately regrets her offer. She would said that he was very, very nervous. It was almost as if his nervousness took over his entire personality. There was a creepy feeling or a not so safe feeling that she had with this guy. He didn't turn on any lights, didn't open any doors, and she really felt like he wasn't seriously looking at the house. When he asked to see the bedrooms upstairs, her uneasiness grows. He walked up the stairs and he kept calling to her. Oh, can you come and show me this? Oh, can you come and show me that? She felt like he was trying to lure her up to her bedroom. She would just shout the answers to his questions up the stairs, and no matter what he did, um, he was not able to uh, get her to go upstairs with him. The stranger eventually leaves, 
but not before giving the woman an important piece of information, his name. The name he left her was Walter Miller. So once we have the name, the research on the name begins. While investigators pour through their data banks in search of Walter Miller, the homeowner works with a forensic sketch artist to create a likeness of their suspect. There was the real possibility that he had been the one that had killed Diane. They was kind of decided, well, let's put this out to the news media and see if we can find somebody that maybe knows this guy or, or got a little bit more information than what we've got right now. A task made more urgent by the fact that Diane Hollick's pristine home had offered up few forensic clues. We weren't getting any physical evidence that we felt like would be able to identify who had killed her. The crime scene was offering us nothing at this point. The sketch is scheduled to air on the 6 o'clock news that night. But as the day wears on, investigators can't shake the thought that there's more to this crime than meets the eye. We decided to focus on something different, which was possibly the sexual gratification aspect of this crime. Ms. Hollick had been fully clothed. There was no evidence at autopsy that she had been sexually assaulted. But just from our experience, we all believed that there was some sexual component to this case. We know that strangulation is a very personal uh, thing that can cause a lot of sexual gratification for the attacker. But how to track this sexual predator? We're going to have to use every trick that we know to try to find out who did this. The investigators return to the house to see if their hunch about the murderer's motive pays off. If there is seminal fluid in the home, we would be able to collect that and use it to get a possible DNA match. Since the test must be done in total darkness, Darla and her team wait for nightfall, then begin sweeping Diane's home. We looked in every room of the house with the alternate light source trying to find some trace of seminal fluid. But uh, we searched, and we searched. Unfortunately, we weren't able to locate anything. It was not a good feeling. <laughs> it was uh, fairly distressing that we had combed the crime scene and not been able to yield anything. Davis hopes that what little evidence they do have will yield better results. We had called in an expert in crime scene analysis to personally analyze and look at our evidence. Including the abandoned bath towel. He went over that towel with a magnifying glass over every inch of it and found these two very tiny hair fragments. Has Davis found the key to the killer's identity? Much to her disappointment. These were not complete hairs. These did not contain a root. And that's very important. Because if you have a root on the end of a hair shaft, then you're able to take that root and run DNA on it. And then you would be able to get a full profile that would be able to tell you exactly who the hair came from. Without the root, the hair would offer up only a partial DNA profile. We knew that the mitochondrial DNA by itself was not going to be enough evidence to tell us who did the murder. So we knew it was not going to be all that helpful to us. As for the name the mystery man gave to one of the homeowners... There was two people. One of them was like 101 years old, and the other, Walter Miller, was, I think, 51, which would have been too old for our suspect. It has been a long and frustrating 72 hours since Diane Hollick's murder, and the investigative team has worked day and night on the case. I just kept telling myself, we have to keep putting one foot in front of the other, keep the investigation moving, because if the investigation stops moving, then it's dead. Will the sketch of the suspect offer up any new leads? We broadcasted the composite and kind of the story or ruse that this guy was using when he went to these women's homes. And it was probably within 10 minutes that somebody called our tip line saying that they thought that he had come to their home. Might they have finally found their killer? This man was not looking for a home. He was looking for a victim. The police sketch has uncovered a potential lead in finding the man who strangled 43-year-old Diane Hollick in her upscale Austin, Texas home. We got a phone call from one of the detectives downtown who said, we had a witness call in. She has some incredible information. You need to get here right away. This man apparently had come to her home six months earlier and was very, very forceful in wanting to get into the house. 
When the witness refuses to let him in, he leaves. But several months later, the strange man returns. Her husband has just left. She's home alone with her daughter. And he, again, tries to convince her to let him inside the house. And again, she's telling him, no, you can't come in my house. If you want to look at my house to buy it, you can call the realtor. But the man persists. He starts getting very agitated. He's yelling at her. And she finally convinces him that he has to leave. But she is so disturbed by this entire encounter with this man that she gets a piece of paper and a pen and scribbles down his license plate number off of his minivan. And she kept that license plate number in a drawer in her house. When she sees the composite sketch on the news broadcast days later, she immediately calls police. This lady tells us that, yes, this guy that gave a similar story was at her house, and she had his license plate number. It was like, wow, let's, let's get rolling on this. Finally, a break. The fact that uh, this man returned to her home and was so aggressive about wanting to get in uh, told us that he was amping up uh, his hunt. We felt like, because he'd gone to numerous neighborhoods all over Austin, that he had an urge right now that um, he was wanting to satisfy. Everything that we learned about this man made us more and more suspicious that this was the man that had killed Diane, that that's who we were looking for. Investigators run the man's license plate number through their computer database. The name from the license plate comes back to Anthony Russo. We realized that the physical description of Tony Russo very much matches the physical description that we were getting from all these women from these homes. But Russo seems an unlikely suspect. The married father of two plays in a Christian band and is the music director at the New Life in Christ Church in a quiet community a 40-minute drive from Austin. Could this God-fearing man have a dark side? We ran his name through a computer history check, and it showed that he had been convicted and sent to prison out of Lake Jackson, Texas. Lake Jackson Police Department said that Tony Russo was actually a suspect in numerous incidents of women being attacked and choked. And they were very surprised that he was not still in jail. He got a 20-year sentence and that he was out in eight years. So they felt like he was a very high-risk offender and that he was definitely a danger to women. We had been working several days, uh, very little rest. But when we got this information, and we got a name, and we all of a sudden we realized that this is a man who has a history of choking women. It was like we got a second wind, and we decided that we had to go and find him right away. We got to the Russo's house with the search warrant. The house was a, a trailer. Um, it was on a small plot of land. It wasn't the fancy ranch he had told the ladies that he had owned. Investigators find Russo at home. When Mr. Russo opens the door, he doesn't seem all that surprised that the police are there. He invites us in, and we tell him that his name has come up in an investigation in Austin and ask him if he'd be willing to come back to our office and speak with us about that. He seems rather calm, and he agrees uh, to go with the police. Can I ask what this is about? What we're going to do is we're going to basically ask you about your whereabouts on certain dates. With Russo out of the way, the investigators comb through his home. The search of the, of the trailer consisted of looking for the jewelry that belonged to the victim, the zip ties that could have been used in any possible ligature, anything that would give us some indication that he had been at the victim's residence. Meanwhile, Tony Russo is being questioned about his whereabouts on the day of Diane's death. On that particular day, he actually does put himself in Austin going to a religious uh, radio station that we have here in town. And that's near where Diane was killed, near Diane's home. He claims that he went down there to kind of get his band promoted, but that when he gets to the radio station, he knocks on the door. Sometimes they answer the door, sometimes they don't. When no one came to the door, I went ahead and left. Uh, About what time was that? Mm, four o'clock, I believe. At that point, that was pretty much when the storm was blowing in. He's asked point blank if he'd been searching for real estate. Uh, but he denied going to anybody's home, looking for a home, or even in the market to buy a home. And when shown a picture of Diane Hollick, Russo barely reacts. I don't recall ever seeing her 
if she's saying that I've stole something from her, then I'm sorry. I don't I don't know what to say. But I haven't stolen anything from anybody. I work my tail off for what I have. Back at Tony Russo's home. Once the search was completed, we found nothing. We just assumed that he probably threw everything away or hid it somewhere that we would never find it. With no confession and no evidence against Russo, police have no choice but to let him go. I'm disappointed, but it doesn't really surprise me. I think that somebody who's been in jail for eight years has had eight years to figure out how to commit a crime and not get caught by the police. And I think he was hunting and evolving and figuring out the best way he could, he could do something and get away with it. Investigators fear they've let a killer walk free. It was scary. It was very scary. We felt like we had a murderer on the loose, and we didn't know when he might kill again. Investigators have no hard evidence to link their only suspect, 37-year-old Tony Russo, to the murder of IBM project manager Diane Hollick. We really had nothing other than the general description. We knew we were going to need more than that. Russo admits to being in Diane Hollick's neighborhood the day of her murder, but says he was there to drop off a CD at a local Christian radio station. He had gone there and knocked on the door, and that the doors were locked, and that nobody came. Then he drove home. To verify Russo's alibi, investigators decide to pay the station manager a visit. We got a completely different story from the radio station manager. The manager basically told us that he knew Tony Russo, but he said that he never saw him that day. And given the approaching tornado, a visitor would have been hard to miss. Everybody in the station had to move to the front of the building, and they opened the door to equalize the pressure in case the storm came in. From that room, they had a direct view of the open front doors. So if anyone had approached the front doors the day of that storm, they would have seen them immediately. About what time was that? Mm, 4 o'clock, I believe. And they said if he'd have been there at 4, everybody would have been in the lobby. So we knew at that point that Mr. Russo was telling us an abject lie. But without proof he's their killer, Tony Russo will walk free. Then investigators hear from yet another female homeowner. This young mother was home alone. Her husband is at work. And a man comes and knocks on her door. He is holding a flyer in his hand that he had gotten from a box that was out in her yard. And he asks if he can come in her home. He was very cordial like he was with everybody else. Asked about the dogs, asked about the security system. She had two kids with her at the house, and one of them was sleeping in a bedroom. They walk around the house. And when they get into one of the bedrooms, he kind of spins around on her. She said he turned from a man into a monster. His eyes changed. His face changed. He looked not like a human being, but more like an attack animal. And she started to panic at that time. And then all of a sudden, she hears her baby cry. The woman runs from the room to attend to her child. Flustered, the man flees, leaving a critical clue behind. She noticed that he had brought one of the black and white flyers into her house. The woman slides it underneath a pile of colored flyers and puts the disturbing incident out of her mind. But when she gets wind of the search for a murder suspect posing as a home buyer, She called and she basically said, I think I might have a flyer with his fingerprints on it. We immediately sent a crime scene person over to the house to uh, pick up the flyer and bring it back to the station. Mr. Russo had told us in the interview that he was not looking to purchase a home, had not been looking at houses. Well, it has to be coincidental because I hadn't been in any neighborhood. He denied that he had ever taken a flyer from anybody's homes. I'm just telling you, I haven't done that. I haven't touched any flyers that I have ever been in Austin looking at houses. He said we would never find his fingerprint on any flyer ever. The lab results tell another story. We got a hit. Uh, we had four good latent fingerprints that belonged to Tony Russo on that flyer. They realize how close this homeowner came to the same tragic end as Diane. She probably came the closest, was probably the one that would have had something bad happen to her. And I think she sensed that. She felt that. She said that. It was just, I guess, by the grace of God that the baby cried and, and gave her an out. Really affected her, really freaked her out that I let this guy into my house and I could have been that woman. Russo is arrested for making a false report to an officer. 
It's a misdemeanor, but it's enough to keep him in jail until they're ready to charge him with murder. They ask 15 of the female homeowners who'd come in contact with the suspected killer to attend a live lineup. There was approximately five other men of the same height and body type, hair, uh, eye color, as the suspect in this particular case. Repeat the following phrase. You have a beautiful house. You have a beautiful house. We put these people side by side, and we give them things to say that were uh, said to all these other people. I remembered your house from before. Kind of his ruse, whatever he used to get into the homes. I'm going to pay cash for a house. 10 out of the 15 witnesses identified Tony Russo as the man who came to their home. Now it's up to police to prove motive. We can assume it's because he likes to attack women. When I start to uh, ask him questions about whether he choked women and whether he liked choking women. We had some very interesting conversations about some cases that you were involved in. Those cases involved you choking women. And at that point, he terminated the interview. I would really, really like to see my wife. So our big dilemma here is how do we make the jump from lying to get into a home to actually murdering somebody? Investigators have a theory that's rapidly gaining ground. We believe that Tony Russo came to Diane Holick's home um, the, the morning of her death. When he found her to be the perfect victim, young, beautiful, and home alone, he told her he'd come back later that day with his wife. It was our theory that he returned during the storm. I think he took all the tools he would need to subdue his victim. She probably gave him a bath towel from her bathroom to dry off with. At that point, we surmised that she had been taken from behind and laid on the carpet and strangled. He dragged her body into the bedroom. And then left her upstairs, deceased. And then when he was done with the deed, he would take it all with him and destroy it. And that's why we had not been able to find any piece of evidence linking him to Diane up to that point. Would the tiny hairs found on the bath towel provide police with that crucial link to investigators' excitement? The mitochondrial sequence from the hair fragments was consistent with Tony Russo's DNA. But that partial DNA profile could also have come from someone else entirely. To make their case, investigators will need to prove Russo is near the scene of the murder the day Diane was killed. First, they issue a subpoena for his phone records. Then we were able to issue a second subpoena to get the actual cell phone towers that his calls were hitting off of. And by getting the locations of those cell phone towers, we could place Tony Russo in the vicinity of Diane Holick's home at about the time she was killed. Investigators now have enough to charge Russo with Diane Holick's murder. But with the evidence against him largely circumstantial, is it enough to convict him? We decided that it would be an important piece of information if we could get Mr. Russo's computer and we could search it to see if he had ever pulled up the listing for Diane's house. But what Davis discovers about Tony Russo leaves even seasoned investigators reeling. We finally zeroed in on what the motive was. It was horrifying. Investigators finally have enough evidence to charge 37-year-old Tony Russo with strangling Diane Hollick to death. When we found Tony Russo's fingerprints on that flyer, it was a huge relief because we finally had a piece of physical evidence that connected Tony Russo to Diane's murder. Hoping to strengthen her case, Darla Davis tries to uncover all she can to convince the jury that Russo is guilty. Well, we were able to get a printout of the internet history of Mr. Russo's computer. And that's just basically a list of every internet site that that computer has gone to. They were looking for evidence Russo had been in search of homes for sale. Instead, they were horrified by the site he repeatedly visited. The website describes itself as tastefully erotic death scenes. You can choose the way that you would like to see a woman killed, and his choice was asphyxiation. The 37-year-old married father of two had viewed a shocking 1,000 pictures of women being strangled. I've been a prosecutor for almost 20 years, and I've never seen anything 
close to what I was seeing on this website. But it's Russo's last download in the days before Diane's murder that really gets their attention. The last story was a man who acted like he was going to buy a home, got into a woman's home, and basically strangled her to satisfy the urge of the asphyxiation. And the bottom line was that the, uh, the murder in the story said to make it look like it was a robbery, and that way nobody would ever suspect the strangulation was actually the whole point of the murder, not the robbery. It was sickening. Obviously, the person who had been looking at these pictures and then who had recreated it in real life was a dangerously disturbed person. To pursue the death penalty, Davis must prove the murder was committed during a burglary. So they returned to Russo's trailer, hoping to find Diane's $20,000 engagement ring. It took a very long time to piece by piece go through everything in the house, every piece of clothing, look in every cabinet, look in every little tiny place that someone could hide a piece of jewelry. Despite their best efforts, they come up empty-handed. We found nothing that would help with the investigation. As they drive away, something catches Detective De Los Santos's eye. As we completed the search over at the, at the trailer, we noticed that there was some fencing that was still rolled up that had not been put out. And keeping the fencing together were these zip ties. We knew that zip ties had been used to bind Diane's hands. So that was a eureka moment. That was something that was very significant. They remove the tie and send it in for analysis. The crime scene expert at the Department of Public Safety was able to compare the size of the zip ties that we found on Mr. Russo's property to the size of the markings on Diane's wrists and found that they were a match. On February 5th, 2004, the trial of Anthony Patrick Russo gets underway in an Austin, Texas courtroom. 14 women take the stand to testify that Russo had approached them about purchasing their home. Mr. Russo was in no position financially to begin to afford the houses he was looking at. He wasn't the person that he portrayed himself. His finances were practically in ruins. Davis presents the mitochondrial DNA evidence from the hair fragments, along with the disturbing details of Russo's internet history. We subpoenaed the webmaster for this website, and he provided us unfettered access so that we could recreate for the jury the specific vignettes that Tony Russo had been looking at. Can Davis paint a convincing picture of a man not motivated by sex, but by the overwhelming urge to kill? With a sexual sadist, it's not just playing at consensual bondage. What he is after is hunting, taking a woman unawares and killing her. For him, the climax is not a sexual act that we would understand. It is the actual act of homicide. After deliberating for 11 hours, the jury reaches their decision. We, the jury, find the defendant, Patrick Anthony Russo, guilty of the offense of capital murder. And he received a life sentence. And they chose not to give him the death penalty, which I'm fine with. As long as Tony Russo is behind bars and can't hurt any other women, how can I not feel good about that? Diane's friends and family breathe a sigh of relief when they hear the verdict. I turned around to Diane's parents, and we just hugged. But we hugged so hard, it was like we almost hugged right into our bones. Tony Russo won't be eligible for parole until he is 93 years old. In a small rural village, a farmer and his wife are found dead in their home. I seen his body laying on the floor. I would have never imagined something like this. Both victims shot, both stabbed. She had some knives in her back. It was horrible. Who killed them and why so savagely? You don't know if he's in the neighborhood and will strike again. We were really frightened. To catch the murderer, investigators must stake everything on a risky undercover operation. 
but can they coerce the ruthless killer into coming clean? Is there any truth to that? I need to know the truth. The small town of Enderby, British Columbia, is a place where neighbors know and trust each other. It's beautiful, the people are friendly. It's a lovely community. Most of us were dairy people, so there's dozens of little dairy farms all over Deep Creek. 48-year-old Dirk Rolf Seema grew up in the picturesque community and never saw a reason to leave. My brother Dirk was a very dedicated farmer, hardworking, always loved the farming life, I guess, and uh, it's what he knew and learned from when he was a little boy. Dirk's hard work over the years had paid off. He had a successful farm and a healthy financial nest egg, but there was something still missing from his life. He was a bachelor for a very long time. Then Audrey came across his ad in the personals section of the local newspaper. They ended up being a really good couple and got married, and that was that. They agree on everything, or almost. Audrey wanted the llamas, not Dirk. Dirk did not want llamas. But when Dirk retires from dairy farming, Audrey gets her way. How do you in love? <laughs> I think Audrey really wanted the llamas because she liked to do knitting and, and spinning and stuff. She was so excited about the spinning and the weaving and so excited about life. Audrey's no-nonsense husband is a helping hand in demand. Dirk was very meticulous and because of that he's very dependable. You knew how he would do things, you knew the end result was what you expected. So it seems out of character when on November 26, 2001, Dirk fails to show up as promised to do some work for Kevin. I tried calling him on Sunday and didn't get an answer, and his answering machine didn't come on, which was unusual because that had never happened before. I thought maybe he would show up at work Monday morning, which Monday morning come and he didn't show up. Dirk's like clockwork. I mean, if he says he's going to be there, he's going to be there. When four days later, Kevin still has not heard from Dirk. I stopped in at his place, drove into his yard, made a loop of the yard. Everything looked in order. Kevin does notice the couple's car is gone. Perhaps they'd taken an impromptu road trip. It seems unlikely, though, for such a predictable pair. Dirk would let somebody know if he was gone. Audrey, too, was missed. There were meetings and things and events with the spinning, and she just wasn't there. I was starting to suspect something was wrong. Alarm sets in when over a week goes by without family members hearing anything from the couple. Usually what he would do is he would call my mom or say, you know, he's gone for a week or going away for a few days or whatever. So and I says, that's strange. This is weird. Something's wrong here. On December 2nd, the family contacts Tony Tillert and asks him to stop by Dirk's property. I kind of already, you know, you had this little pit in my stomach, and I was almost scared to go over there, but I did. The llamas had not been fed, and it looked like they hadn't been fed for a little while. And so that's when I realized there was something really not right. He scales the home's upper porch and nervously peers into the window. I looked in. And I seen his body laying on the floor. And it had a blanket over it. So my thought was, oh my gosh, I hope he hasn't had a heart attack. But the reality will soon prove more horrifying than anything Dirk's friend can imagine. 911. I'm not sure what I'm seeing, but it it's really peculiar. I can just barely see through the window, and it just appears to be a body. All right, so you think, think there is a, a body on the floor. I and do you know this person? Yes, I do. He's a good friend. And what is his name? Dirk Rolfema. 
Police are quickly dispatched to the scene. And when they showed up, they just kicked the door in. So I went in with them. And that's when we discovered Wadre was in the room. The couple had been shot to death. Then viciously stabbed. The bodies were on the floor. Audrey was close to a chair. She had some knives in her back. Dirk was laying a little bit to her left. He was covered with a couple blankets. The hands of both Dirk and Audrey were duct taped, as it was their feet. Uh, and there was also some zap straps uh, around their, their wrists. Homicide detectives contact Dirk's family with the horrendous news. You know, you just don't think of anything like this ever happening. So. So it was uh, very surprised, of course, very shocked. Um, I never dreamt anything like this before in my life. Word of the murders travels through the community like wildfire. How could this happen in a small area like Enderby to two innocent people? What might have motivated such a savage crime? It was still very hard to understand, even for a minute, you know, why they were murdered. It just, nothing made sense, and it was a terrible loss. The brutality of the killings is a shock, even to seasoned investigators. You want to catch this person, and you've got to do a good job from the first minute you're there to the last minute of the investigation. The small Enderby detachment asks for help investigating the case. Lisa Stewart of British Columbia's Major Crimes Unit joins the team. Having been involved in hundreds of investigations, I know that they have twists and turns and they take on a life of their own. And this case promises to be more challenging still. Was this a crime of passion? Was this related to drugs, revenge? Who would have the motive to, to want them dead? In their home in Enderby, British Columbia, a popular couple is found dead. They had been bound with duct tape before being shot and repeatedly stabbed. It was a, quite a brutal murder. I've investigated probably 13 homicides, and uh, this was one of the, the worst ones. We have to determine what's the motive in their homicides. Had the couple been in debt to the wrong crowd? Dirk was the most honest person in the world. He wouldn't own owned anybody a penny. Is it somebody that uh, broke in to steal something from them? But there are no signs of forced entry. And when police dust for fingerprints, they find none. The smell of fuel in the home is overwhelming. The killer had doused the couple's bodies in gasoline. It appears that he was trying to hide his tracks by setting the house on fire. We observed a uh, timer that was plugged into a wall, and plugged into the timer was a curling iron. This became a key part of what we call our holdback. Information not to be released to the public. The only person that would know about this was the person that had actually committed the, the murders. If you find information coming back to you that only the murderer would know, then that, you know, you're hot on the trail of the number one suspect. They hope the duct tape used to bind the victims might also provide clues, this time in the form of DNA. Also found at the scene was uh, shell casings. Dirk and Audrey had both been shot. These shell casings can be used for DNA analysis or it can also be used for firearm analysis. Investigators submit the evidence for DNA testing, knowing all too well the results are weeks away. All of a sudden, time is your enemy. Lisa Stewart's immediate task is to determine when the couple was killed. Speaking with friends and family, neighbors, one of the first questions that you ask them is, when was the last time that you saw or heard from uh, Dirk or Audrey? We also called in uh, a forensic pathologist, and she provided us an approximate timeline that the bodies had been in the house. When she tells police the couple have been dead about a week, the investigators are crestfallen. 
The first 24 to 48 hours are crucial in a homicide investigation. He's had seven days to either run and hide or put himself away from the area. If they plan to catch him, investigators will need to refine that timeline. We knew that his visa had been used on Saturday, uh, November 24th in Vernon area. And so I then went to the businesses where the visa transactions occurred and uh, presented the photo of Dirk. And they were able to, uh, you know, say with certainty that that's the individual who made the purchases that day. So Dirk was still alive that Saturday. What about his wife? There was a phone call to Audrey at 4 o'clock from one of her friends. And we believe that that was probably the last contact that she had with anybody prior to her murder. Given that the following day, others tried to contact the couple. And normally, you know, Audrey would pick up by the second or third ring. And if she didn't, the answer machine would pick up. But the phone rang and rang with nobody answering. In the hopes of pinpointing still further the time of the attack, investigators asked Dirk's brother, Barry Rolfsema, to join them at the victim's home. So I, I walked through the scene. I knew it happened right after supper. I could see what all the utensils and the dishes, the way they were situated, they were washed, but they weren't dried. They were still sitting there. All of it suggesting that the killer had interrupted the couple between 5 and 7 o'clock on the evening of Saturday, November 24th then brutally murdered them. As I walk through into the living room, I see a big uh, area of blood, of course. It was difficult to see. Outside, Barry points out to police that the couple's car is missing. We felt that it would be an integral part of our investigation if we could find it. The brother also notices the nozzle is gone from the tractor fuel tank. And that the hose from the gas tank was down. And that's something his brother would have never done. Was this the source of gas used to try and ignite the farmhouse? My instinct was is that it was basically uh, somebody knew the place. Could be family, too. You hope it's not your family, that's for sure. Dirk and Barry's younger brother is already on investigators' radar. He was known to the members of Enderby Detachment. He's the black sheep, so he's done things that he should have never done in his life, associated with people that he shouldn't be associating with. This individual had a bit of a downtrodden lifestyle. He had borrowed money from his family. But they had turned off the money taps. Families are capable of doing anything when emotions are involved, even killing those that they love the most. Investigators ask the brother to come in for an interview, and though he reluctantly agrees, he was certainly raising some red flags because he wasn't being forthright. He wasn't being cooperative. We had to ascertain if he had anything financially to gain from Dirk and Audrey's homicide through the estate or, or will. Lisa Stewart is concerned by what she finds. I met with uh, Dirk and Audrey's accountant and financial planner in regards to the land, uh, the house. It would have gone to the family members of Dirk and Audrey. Including Dirk's younger brother. Police ask both siblings to provide DNA samples that will be compared to that on the duct tape found at the crime scene. Barry immediately agrees, but Dirk's younger brother digs in his heels. So that, of course, puts suspicion in the police even more when somebody doesn't want to give DNA up. And obviously then, bingo, they think it's him. Anybody that's not involved would want to help the police as much as they can. Under pressure by police and family members, the brother finally cooperates. But will his DNA provide a match to that left at the scene by the killer? While they wait for DNA results, Lisa Stewart looks into another relationship that may have gone sour, this time between Dirk and his neighbor. He had a very large dairy operation, but he didn't have enough land to support the cattle to feed them. So he had a lease agreement with Dirk for his property to use to feed the cows. But the man hadn't won many friends in the community. He wasn't a very popular person, and I think that a lot of people saw him as all about business and not about relationships. 
In fact, the neighbor may have been contacted about a very lucrative new business using the land he'd leased from Dirk. He had been approached by two males described to us as biker looking. They had uh, come to the property uh, to negotiate a business transaction to have a marijuana grow up on the property. Was Dirk about to set his neighbors straight? If Dirk decided not to lease him, you know, any more of his land, that that would have, you know, basically been the end of his business. Could that have been the motive for murder? Is there any truth to that? I need to know the truth. Sergeant Lisa Stewart is en route to meet with the neighbor of murder victims Dirk and Audrey Rolfsema. As an investigator, you think, OK, is there a motive here? Does he have anything to gain by their homicides? The man may have been contacted about an illegal grow up on the land he leased from Dirk. So when we hear a grow up is potentially involved in the investigation, it certainly raises our suspicions. I met with him at his property, and I said, you know that I'm speaking with numerous witnesses. The neighbor is surprisingly open about his conflicts with Dirk. I think he wanted to be seen as cooperating with the investigation. She confronts him about the alleged grow-up. I've learned that two possibly Hells Angels approached you to do a grow-up. Is there any truth to that? I need to know the truth. And his response was, no, that's ridiculous. You know, never happened. He allowed me to look around the property. There was no signs of a grow-up anywhere on the property. What's more, the man's alibi around the time of the murders turns out to be airtight. The neighbor was able to say, on these days I was here, and uh, we were able to substantiate that. The man is cleared, but not before telling investigators about a farmhand who'd once locked horns with Dirk Rolf Sima. And so this individual, who we later learned to be Rene Therion, had lived on Dirk and Audrey's property for approximately a year. Dirk had a, a rental trailer, and uh, Rene had lived in this trailer. We had to move on to doing some background on Rene and his activities. Police discover a long simmering conflict between Rene and Dirk. The dispute was very volatile. They were both very angry. Their fight had started one year earlier when Rene headed home to Quebec to visit family. When he left, the weather was below zero, freezing. During that period of time, the oil tank had gone low. Dirk, he was concerned about the place freezing. So Dirk, as the landlord, went into the trailer and, and uh, checked on the pipes and made sure that they were fine. When Rene came back, he was so mad that he was going to phone the police. He was quite uh, taken aback that uh, Dirk had the audacity, basically, to go into his uh, trailer without his permission. So there ensued this big battle between Rene and Dirk, and Dirk wouldn't back down. Finally, in February of 2001, nine months before the murders, Dirk served Rene with eviction papers. But that didn't end things. Rene was still working at the farm that was close by, so there was still friction there. Rene's feud with Dirk hardly seems proof of murder. But in the days following the discovery of the bodies and disappearance of the couple's car, Rene had made some suspicious comments. Rene had been working on some large dairy farms, and these dairy farms, of course, have uh, large manure pits. Rene had made the comment, they're never going to find that car. Rene had said, well, if I would uh, hide a car, I would put it in the manure pit. Sergeant Stewart decides to pay Rene a visit at his current home a motel on the highway. His grasp of the English language wasn't that great, so, you know, we're trying to communicate with one another as best as I can. And she asked Rene about his altercation with Dirk. He was adamant that he had not let the tank uh, run dry or, or very low, so he felt that Dirk used that as an excuse to actually go into his trailer and snoop around. Here it was, you know, a year later, and he was still animated, you know, and trying to defend his position and that Dirk was in the wrong. But Rene insists that the disagreement was never so serious that he would resort to violence, much less murder. What's more, he was at work milking the cows the day the couple was killed. 
and he can prove it. He pulled out a calendar, and he had it marked with all of his shifts, that he worked, you know, a day shift or an afternoon shift or an evening. I mean, he worked very long hours. So in essence, he's providing us an alibi. But is he willing to provide a sample of his DNA? He wanted to speak with a lawyer, and I said, by all means, you know, speak with a lawyer. Um, you should know what your rights are before you voluntarily provide a sample of your DNA. A few days later, Rene shows up at the police station. We went over the consent form, which clearly lays out that it's voluntary and that, you know, it's not being forced upon him. And uh, he provided a, a sample of his DNA. Meanwhile, the test results of another sample are already in, this time from Dirk's younger brother. The DNA never came back to, to him, so it eliminated him as far as DNA. We also were able to do a polygraph, and uh, he passed the polygraph. He was found to be truthful in that he did not murder his brother and his wife. Is this the man who did? The surveillance footage showed a male dressed in fatigues with a bandana pulled up over his face. You don't know if he's your neighbor. You don't know if he's in the neighborhood and will strike again. Investigators are under the gun to find the vicious killer of Enderby residents Dirk and Audrey Rolf Sima. We were frightened. We were really frightened. You start locking your doors and you feel very apprehensive because you just don't know if this is somebody going around killing people for no other reason than to kill somebody. The community became more suspicious of any strangers. Could be anybody. The peaceful townspeople are in a state of panic. So they call in saying there's a fellow riding a mountain bike down the street and he's got us uh, toque down low and we don't recognize him. He's a local person that just happens to be riding his bike. There was a lot of gossip and rumor and innuendo going around town that we as investigators had to filter through to establish what's fact and what's fiction. Pressure from the community? Sure there was. Pressure from the community, this had to be solved. Might the couple's missing car provide police with a much needed break in the case? The person that's driving it may be responsible for the murder. Helicopters scour the area in search of the vehicle and investigators appeal to the public for their help in finding it. The police are looking for a little black Honda. We're very interested in it. It's missing from a homicide scene. All of a sudden, we start getting phone calls from all over British Columbia saying, we've seen this little black Honda. It was seen in Vancouver. It was seen on its way to Prince George. It was seen in Kelowna. While Stewart follows up on the thousands of tips, Pitt goes after surveillance footage from the area. And we had asked the detachments, the police agencies on the road especially, to go to the businesses and to gather all the tapes they could. Including those from the nearest toll booth. I think it is some like 140 hours of videotape had to be watched to see if that little black Honda went through the toll booth. Investigators receive hundreds of sightings, but to their disappointment, none lead them to the couple's missing vehicle. Did the killer, as Rene Terrian had suggested, sink the car in a local manure pit? The pit we're talking about is massive. It, just, it would not just hold a little car. It could hold a semi-truck. Police have the pit drained, but to their disappointment. At the end of the day, there is no car in the bottom. It is just the investigation that's stuck in the mud. A lot of time was taken on trying to find this little car. You kind of get the feeling like, OK, this is going to be a lengthy investigation. On December 10th, eight days after the discovery of their bodies, family and friends gather for a tearful remembrance service for Dirk and Audrey. She was a good friend, a good person. She was kind. I miss her. The community's grief made worse by the knowledge the killer is still on the loose. You don't know if he's your neighbor. You don't know 
if he's in the neighborhood and will strike again. I kept in contact with the police weekly. I said to him that I would phone him once a week until the day that it's solved. I myself spoke to Barry probably several times a week just to say, you know, we haven't forgotten you guys. You know, we're still working. We're still, we're still plugging away. Investigators get access to Dirk and Audrey's banking records and discover a series of withdrawals shortly after the couple was killed. We knew that Audrey's ATM card had been used in the early morning hours shortly after midnight on the 25th of November. And it had been used at a credit union in Armstrong as well. The news brings with it the terrible realization that the torture of Dirk and Audrey was coldly calculated. He had them tied up and duct taped to make sure that he could try to get their PIN numbers for their cards. His ruthless scheme hardly worth the payoff. The first withdrawal was for $80, the second one was for $100. The surveillance footage from the credit union showed a male dressed in fatigues. You could see some type of disguise over his uh, facial features. At an ATM located in a convenience store. The video was actually concentrated on the front door. But just one minute before a withdrawal from Audrey's account. You have one person coming through the front door he goes out of sight of the video. So we didn't actually have him doing the transaction. Could this be Dirk and Audrey's killer? It looks like maybe he shed his overcoat and his mask, and uh, he has a gray hoodie on. The poor quality of the image makes it difficult to identify the man. So we had to draw an image off of the video. Then we had to try to enhance the picture so that it was usable to show to people. Using our police computer system, we put the video out to all the local RCMP. Hopefully somebody out there may know this individual. A rookie cop gets the shock of her life when she opens her email and sees a picture of a friend. Right away, I recognize the person, René Terrier. RCMP officer Joanne Wursta may have identified the man investigators suspect withdrew money from the account of murder victim Audrey Rolfsima. Working in a small community uh, in the Okanagan and being French-Canadian, there's not many people speaking French uh, in that area. When I was introduced to him, I knew that he was working uh, on a farm uh, in Enderby. I believe he said it was a dairy farm. His full name was uh, René Terrien. Dirk Rolfsima's disgruntled former tenant. But not only does Rene have an alibi for the day of the double homicide. He was a very laid back guy, very friendly, just ordinary guy. Are police focusing in on the wrong suspect? Being a police officer, usually you're a very good judge of character. And I would have never thought a million year that he would get in trouble in any way. Investigators will need more than this to prove it. So we have him coming into the store seconds before the bank card is used, but we didn't have any photographs of him using it. How do we know that he's not there to get a quart of milk? You're building, um, I guess you could say, a circumstantial case. These are suspicions, and they're important pieces of circumstantial evidence, but it doesn't add up to proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But it still didn't put Rene committing the actual murders. The farmhand maintains he was at work milking when the murders occurred. Can investigators prove otherwise? We had determined that most likely Dirk and Audrey were killed after they had had supper on the 24th. We knew from the autopsy results that they had just recently consumed uh, a large meal. So that really narrowed down the time frame for us. If Rene worked a full shift that day, how could he possibly have found time to kill the couple? Rene worked a split shift. Uh, so his first shift in the morning was from 11.30 to 4.30, and then his second shift was from 7.30 to 11.30 at night. We believe between the afternoon and the evening milkings, that's when the murder occurred. So it basically gave him a timeline of three hours to actually commit the murders. 
And what about the timing of the ATM withdrawal late that night? He indicated to us that uh, he worked till 1230, but all the computer records for the milking showed that he actually milked the last cow at 1130 that night. Anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes to clean up, he could have left that farm by midnight. Does he have time to go do the ATM transaction at 25 after? Although investigators have videos showing a man in the store that looks like Rene, they need to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt he had time to get there. I drove the back roads doing the average speed limit, and I arrived in Armstrong within 18 minutes. It was part of the puzzle against Rene, but it wasn't enough to arrest him. So why is the farmhand in such a hurry to get out of town? Rene had also given his resignation letter, which really came out of nowhere for the employer. Who quits their job when they have a good paying job and he's getting nervous. Investigators return to Rene's motel, only to discover that he's already moved out and moved on. Why, why did he want to leave town? Back at the detachment, police receive a crucial report from the firearms lab. At the crime scene, there was a 22 casing found. Our firearms lab was able to tell us that the 22 casing was uh, shot by a very rare gun. We also received a photograph of what the firearm would look like. It was a military style weapon. There was eight Calico registered firearms in Canada. We sent uh, police officers to all eight residences in, in Canada, uh, and there was one in the, uh, the Maritimes, and he said, I no longer have it. I sold it to a guy by the name of Rene. Rene Terrian. But did he still own the gun? Lisa Stewart follows up on a tip. Lisa went and talked to uh, the neighbor's boys who worked on the farm with Rene. When I spoke with um, the sons, you know, they had um, observed Rene with a 22 caliber rifle. One of the, the cows was sick and had to be put down. So Rene said, I've got a gun. So he went and got his gun and, uh, and put the cow down. One of the neighbor's boys distinctly remembers the firearm. I had him draw a picture of it, which he did in my notebook. Just from that drawing alone, I was like, yeah, that's the firearm. Top loading 22s are quite unique. It certainly put him as the number one suspect. But again, police will need more to make an arrest. We still needed to prove that Rene was the one that pulled the trigger. Will Rene's long awaited DNA results seal the deal? The odds were one in 9.1 trillion. Four weeks into their investigation, police link the rare 22 caliber rifle used to kill Dirk and Audrey Rolsima to farmhand Rene Terrian. The pieces of the puzzle started coming together. I mean, we're finding out that he has the same weapon. They already know Rene held a grudge against Dirk for entering his trailer, then evicting him from it. Now, Sergeant Ewan Pitt has discovered what may be an additional motivation for the murder. And the Credit Bureau gave us a baseline as to other debts he may have accumulated over years. He had a Dodge pickup, and there was a, a debt on that. He had a number of bank accounts in downtown Salmon Arm. You could see that during the month of December, he was starting to miss some of his payments. Had Rene Terrian, desperate for cash, resorted to cold-blooded killing? We received a report back from the lab that they had found uh, a male profile on the duct tape used to bind Audrey's legs. And they'd compared it to the DNA offered up by the farmhand. And that profile came back as a match to Rene Therrien. But even the DNA results are circumstantial evidence. The duct tape doesn't say that he's the killer. All that shows is that, in this case, Mr. Terrian touched the duct tape at some point. The fact is, is he had rented a trailer on their property for months, and so there was any number of innocent possibilities for how that came to be there. 
The other piece of circumstantial evidence that came into effect in this case was that um, their bank cards were used. And unfortunately, the person who was using the, the bank machine had a mask covering his face. So that didn't tell us who it is. As for the withdrawal at the ATM in the convenience store, He's coming into the store. We don't, he's not actually using the bank card. Those were two important bits, but they weren't enough to lay charges. And they certainly wouldn't have been enough to prosecute. And we felt that we should further investigation to make sure that if we were going to lay a charge, that we wanted to be 100% positive that we would get a conviction at the end of the day. Months pass, but investigators seem no closer to proving the former farmhand is Dirk and Audrey Rolf Sima's killer. Mr. Terrian had moved back to Quebec by this point, and all of their other leads had gone cold. That the killer is still at large gnaws away at the police and the community. Some of the neighbors, they would maybe criticize the, the investigators or the police because it wasn't happening fast enough. You know, this should be dealt with you know, in short order, well, when you try to explain to them that, uh, you know, these types of investigations do take time and you've got to understand that. Finally, in December of 2002, a year after the murders, another officer and myself went down to Quebec and launch a crack undercover operation they hope will see Rene admit to the murders. As time goes on, if they haven't been caught, they feel a little bit more at ease. And so that's to our advantage. Agents posing as criminals carefully court him. They are trying to get Rene to be part of their group. And in order to get the job in the organization, you have to be absolutely clean with uh, no baggage. They are trying to get Rene to speak freely about uh, things that he's done in the past. If you've got any problem that the police are going to be looking into is tell us because we could make it go away. But you have to tell us the details. Like it's a chess game, you know, and, and we're being very strategic. In this case, it took, I believe it was about seven months to get Rene to have the confidence in the undercover operators to be friends, to be their pals. That's when investigators make their move asking Rene to attend a crucial meeting with Mr. Big, the supposed head of the illicit operation. Bob Gobel watches from a nearby room. First, Rene admits to killing the couple. Then... I came back and I cut her down. And I put some gas up there, and on the sofa, and I went to Armstrong. There were a number of holdback uh, bits of evidence, and Mr. Terrian was able to give it all and correctly. He probably brought out four or five points only he would have known. And of course, the biggest one was uh, the timer and the curling iron. I went back after I put the timer. I found the iron there, and I said, oh, it might be worth and I have to uncover what I did. He said that he had set the timer when he was leaving, the timer would go off, the house would start on fire, and all the evidence would be destroyed. I should try the timer first, you know? Probably one of the biggest shocks he ever got was when he came back and that house was still standing. Investigators finally have Rene Terrian where they want him. When you're sitting in a couple rooms over, watching on a monitor, him confessing, or telling you your whole back that, that only three or four of you have, have known for three years, I mean, that's something that you'll never forget. But police are still missing one crucial piece of evidence. The helicopter couldn't find it. Our search and rescue people couldn't find where was the car. A painstaking undercover operation has seen suspect Rene Terrian revealing information only the killer of this couple would know. I came back and I cut her down. And I put some gas up there. But is Terrian's confession enough to convict him of the crime? We don't want to run the risk of having a defense lawyer uh, attack our investigation and have things thrown out. The team decides to go after one final piece of the puzzle. One of the things that Rene revealed in his interview with Mr. Big was that he had hidden the car and that he had hidden it that, that nobody would ever find it. Mr. Big convinces Rene he must destroy all evidence of the murders. 
Rene falls for their ruse and leads them back to BC. And one of the first things that we had him do was point out to our undercover operators to where the car was. And, you know, it was within a highly wooded area. It's up a little forestry road with a huge, deep ravine with lots of uh, cedar trees. And Rene said after he had committed the murders, he had gotten in the car, driven it up this road, and uh, just basically pushed it off the cliff. And that's where it was. And in fact, a tree had fallen on it. So that's why when the search and rescue had gone out in an effort to locate the vehicle, they couldn't see it from the air because it was concealed by uh, by the tree. It is the final piece of indisputable evidence the investigators need. The following day, the undercover operator told Renee to meet him at a gas station in West Kelowna. Myself and another police officer, we walked in and I arrested him for uh, the first degree murder of both Audrey and Dirk. After three years of intense investigation, Dirk and Audrey Rolfsima's killer has finally been caught. It was satisfying. Yeah, it was satisfying. It was a big relief when there was an arrest. Now in police custody, Rene confesses to investigators, casually relating how he ruthlessly murdered the couple. He's kind of scared, but she wasn't. You know, he's the big guy, but she kind of got the balls for that then I punch her. And it's like, you then got no turning back, you know, so that then I shoot. Was it just unfortunate that Audrey was there? Yeah. Because you didn't mind her. No, right? She was okay. Yeah. But you, you found yourself in a position where once you decided to go beyond that point of no return, mm -hmm. you couldn't stop that just him, right? No. And on November 5th, 2006, nearly five years after their deaths, Rene Terrien pleads guilty to the second degree murders of Dirk and Audrey Rolfsima. He is sentenced to 18 years in prison with no chance of parole. To this day, myself and the other investigators, we never really knew what the motive was. Was it financial? Well, financial, what did he get? A couple hundred bucks. You know, was it anger or was it hatred? Only Rene knows, and he's never told us. With the killer safely behind bars, family and friends commemorate the couple at their favorite spot in Enderby. It's just a little memorial of a uh, picture of Dirk and Audrey. And, uh... Time heals, but you don't forget. He robbed them of an amazing life together. There's nothing anybody can do to give that back. People always say, well, it brings closure to the family. It never does. It just doesn't. On the banks of the Wisconsin River, the discovery of a woman's dismembered body. Whatever happened to her was very horrible. Our goal was to find all of the body parts. But without a face and without an identity, she seemed to be lost. Who is she? And what kind of madness possessed her attacker? He cast her aside like trash in a garbage bag. She was truly an innocent person at the hands of a monster. Can investigators piece together the blood-chilling tale and catch a remorseless killer? picturesque village on the shores of the Wisconsin River, where locals and tourists gather to play. There's a lot of canoeing, kayaking, rafting, and swimming in that area. July 30th, 1999, a sunny Friday afternoon. Two kids on vacation with their mom are exploring the riverbank when they come across a bag containing what appears to be body parts. 
The concerned mother contacts police. 911. Detective Joseph Welsh and prosecutor Patricia Barrett are called to the scene of the gruesome discovery. There was a trail that led off of a parking lot. It's kind of wooded. When you got about halfway down that little pathway, you could actually smell something rotten. It was in a black garbage bag. Inside are human remains. This, in fact, appeared to be only the torso. And we were able to examine the torso and see that it was what appeared to be a female black individual. Who is this unidentified woman? And how had her life come to such a horrific end? To find something like this was just unheard of. The discovery was very disturbing. But the fact that we didn't have all of the victim was even more disturbing. Detective Elizabeth Fiegels joins the team for a search of the area. We were looking for any sort of black garbage bags or anything that could contain body parts. It doesn't take long for investigators to spot something out of place. We could see there was a black canvas bag that was hanging on the tree limb over the Wisconsin River. The duffel bag was seized because it was certainly big enough to contain the torso. Police question shocked bystanders, who provide investigators with their first lead. We were initially told by the person that found the torso that there was a strange gentleman hanging in the area. Had he committed the brutal murder and was then drawn back to the scene? Three different people who were interviewed had information about this white male. And details of his suspicious behavior. He had said something about, well, it, it smells really bad, or the police better have gas masks. And uh, shortly after, he disappeared. Leaving the parking lot in a white truck. No one had a license plate. And the actual descriptions of what this particular white male looked like varied. We didn't know if he was a suspect. He could have been a witness to the crime. What they do know is that if they hope to find him, they'll need to move fast. Information regarding his physical description and his vehicle was broadcast to law enforcement agencies. Investigators, meanwhile, secured the crime scene for the night. There was a forecasted thunderstorm coming in. Early the following morning, the sheriff's office launches a comprehensive search of the river to find the rest of the victim. We didn't know if the person had possibly kept some body parts as trophies. Our goal was to find all of the body parts and just put everything together. We returned with several officers, Department of Natural Resources, anyone in the area that had boats. There were several fishing boats being put into the water, probably five or six boats in there. And then there was an attempt to notify people who were actually on the water to go ahead and be on the lookout. Finally, it is a tourist who spots something. Floating in the water, another black garbage bag, and then another. We recovered four or five bags that comprised her whole being. Some of the body parts had been wrapped in multiple bags. Grocery store chain bags inside of garbage bags. When investigators examined the victim's head, they discovered the killer had not only taken her life, he had obliterated her identity. It was very clear that this victim would not be recognizable by uh, friends or relatives. Without a face and without an identity, she seemed to be lost. The gruesome discovery sends shockwaves through the community. I think a lot of people became very afraid of the fact that there was some kind of maniac serial killer Police try to quell the fear, but they are up against vivid public memories. Wisconsin is very familiar with serial killer cases in that it's had Ed Gein, who became famous in the 50s, uh, killing several women. You've got Jeffrey Dahmer, of course. Both murderers notorious for having dismembered their many victims. Was this woman killed at the hands of another, following in their bloody footsteps? I didn't know what we were dealing with someone was just trying to hide the corpse or 
This was the possibility that there was a, a serial killer. Can police find the brutal murderer before he strikes again? There's nowhere to look until you know who your victim is. On the banks of the Wisconsin River, the body of a young black woman has been found, dismembered and rendered unrecognizable. From looking at the face, there was absolutely no way we were able to identify who that was. It was a horrific crime. Is a serial killer on the rampage? Police pour through their databases in search of any similar cases. There weren't any in the state of Wisconsin. Then they spread out nationwide. 10 days earlier, there was a similar case in New Hampshire. In which the woman's body had also been skillfully dismembered. This victim had been disarticulated, meaning surgically taken apart. Could that precision be the key to the killer's identity? It was somebody who had done something like that, at least with animals before. A hunter, perhaps, or even a butcher. That's often the way animals are done for processing. Was this the killer's grisly signature, left behind in both New Hampshire and Wisconsin? They might be dealing with somebody who was traveling through various areas doing the same types of crimes. While investigators compare notes with the New Hampshire authorities, Wisconsin police continue the search for the strange man leaving their crime scene in a white vehicle. We put out an attempt to locate for that truck and that subject. But with each passing hour, investigators lose hope of finding him. We had no license plate or anything to go on. That's when police get wind of another lead. A man came forward and said that he was on the Wisconsin River. He had discovered the duffel bag in the water, and he dragged it to the shoreline. He says he thought it was camping equipment. He dumped the bag onto the ground. He realized because of the smell that it obviously wasn't camping equipment. He assumed it was an animal, and he left the torso on the riverbank. Then, in his attempt to salvage the duffel bag, he took that bag and just hung it up over the tree uh, where we had located it. Police bring the young man in for questioning, and though they quickly determined he had no connection to the murder, we had now made a connection from that simple duffel bag to the torso that we had found. For investigators, however, that's barely the beginning. It's very difficult to pursue an investigation in a meaningful way if you don't know who your victim is. They hope the autopsy will provide some clues. We were able to determine that she was from 16 to 25 years old. Five foot two to five foot four tall, approximately 150 pounds. Had no distinguishing tattoos, no scars. There were no fillings. There were perfect teeth. So the odds of finding dental records that would be useful to our investigation was pretty remote. She was someone's daughter, perhaps someone's sister, now known only as Jane Doe. But the detectives have a plan for identifying her. We had found the hands. We can identify her with fingerprints. Or so they hope. They run the victim's prints through the National Crime Information Center's database. But if an individual has never been arrested, or for whatever reason, they never had their fingerprints on file, you would not get any response. And though a fingerprint could be all it takes to get the investigation into high gear... Came up with nothing. No one had these prints on file. Undaunted, the detectives turned to the nationwide database of missing people. The missing black females that we had throughout the United States were in the area of over a 1,000. That was overwhelming. We had our work cut out for us. Going through the list, we got it down to about six or 700. Missing women that might be their Jane Doe. Detective Welch and I established a phone bank with 10 telephones. We divided the agencies up into states. And investigated each and every name on the list. If we miss simply one person, that could be our person that was the victim. So we wanted to make sure that we covered all bases. But despite the team's massive effort, at the end of the week-long telephone calls, we came up with nothing. Desperate for any break in the case, investigators appeal to the general public for help in identifying their victim. 
a cab driver had picked up a, a woman who was a, a dancer at one of the local clubs. The cab driver thought that she matched the description of our Jane Doe. But when police follow up on the story, we were able to determine her fingerprints and tattoos, eliminated her as our possible Jane Doe. In the days following, law enforcement really had created a lot of follow-up work to try to run down each of these tips. A mother called and reported that she was concerned our Jane Doe may have been her daughter. But the lead goes nowhere. That's when investigators receive a tip they hope will help unravel the mystery of the murdered woman. The caller tells police that the victim is from San Francisco and that her name is Dolores. We then obtained a search warrant for telephone records from the tip line. We then went and interviewed the subscriber to that telephone. It soon became apparent that this individual was not stable, that he was delusional. He had no one that was close to anyone that we felt was our victim. It seemed like a lot of work spinning our wheels. Just as it seems, the investigation will never get traction. Manchester, New Hampshire had a suspect in their case. Is he also the ruthless killer of Wisconsin's Jane Doe? And does he have others in his sights? We were fearful of another discovery of a dismembered corpse. Weeks after the shocking discovery of a dismembered female body in Wisconsin, there is a possible breakthrough in the investigation. A 39-year-old Czech native, Václav Pilch, has been arrested and charged with murder and dismemberment in New Hampshire. It was known that he worked in a meatpacking plant and was a meat cutter. Could he also be the mystery woman's killer? After he left New Hampshire, he went to the state of Maine and then went to Texas. Had Pilch traveled through Wisconsin on a killing spree? The investigators who were working that case at the time did an extensive interview of that suspect. To the disappointment of police on the Jane Doe case, they completely accounted for his time on a timeline, and they were not able to link him with Wisconsin in any way. With few other leads, the investigation comes to a standstill. Months do pass by, and it's very, very frustrating. Everything that we were working on, every lead that we had, we were coming to a dead end. And their greatest challenge might lie not with identifying the killer, but rather his prey. No additional information could be gleaned about the identity of the victim. It was absolutely critical that we identify the victim as soon as possible so that we can do a really constructive investigation. The next step was that uh, facial reconstruction needed to be done. Investigators looked to world-renowned forensic anthropologist Leslie Eisenberg for help. I was approached by Detective Joe Welch, who was interested in having a facial approximation done. In other words, an attempt for someone to build a face on the skull. It's a tall order to take the woman's skull, some ethnographic data and a lot of imagination, and craft a face that might look like the victim. You never know what the unknown person actually look like. But the goal of doing something like this is to spark something in someone looking at the photo of the facial approximation. There's a problem, however, and it's a big one. It would have required utilizing the head that actually was recovered. And Jane Doe's head still has traces of tissue attached a serious stumbling block for a reconstructive process that requires a dry, clean skull. In removing the soft tissue, you would also be removing evidence. There were knife marks or tool marks that were discovered, which could have some potential evidentiary value. Barrett must make a difficult choice. Remove the flesh to help identify the victim or preserve the evidence to help prosecute her killer. District Attorney Barrett said that she did not want it done. She said no. 
I was unwilling this early in the case to have the actual head itself be damaged in any way. I was concerned when District Attorney Barrett said no. Detective Welsh was very unhappy with my answer. He actually leaned across my desk to tell me that he didn't think that I was making the right decision in this matter. My concern was where do we go from here and how do we get this information out to the public without having a clay reconstruction done. And I told him that it was my decision in this matter and that there had to be another way. If he wanted it that badly, he was going to find the other way. The detectives are stumped. I went to Dr. Eisenberg again and asked her if there was any alternative. She has a radical idea, one that involves an engineering process known as rapid prototyping. What that involves is creating a mock-up or a replica of anything you can imagine. It could be a machine part. It could be part of a skull used in preparation by a plastic surgeon to practice a surgery. Could they use the process to build an exact replica of the victim's skull? If so... A facial approximation could be done without damaging the original skull. Providing investigators with a face that might lead them to Jane Doe's identity. The process would be groundbreaking. This was an opportunity to bring engineering and rapid prototyping and apply it to a real world forensic situation. I was stunned. It was science I had never heard of. But will it work? Investigators send the skull to the local hospital for a CT scan that reveals the contours of the bone. We took that CAT scan to the Milwaukee School of Engineering. Those data are fed into a machine. Designed to build industrial prototypes from thin layers of paper. There are about 4,000 sheets of paper per inch. The laser cuts each sheet to form a thin cross-section of the skull. The CAT scan data tell the machine where to cut the contours. The cut sheet then provides a foundation for the next layer. The skull is being built from the bottom up. After 30 hours of production, the result appears to be nothing more than a big block of paper. But it's what lies within it that counts. You need to chip away at the extra raw material that was laid down by the sheets of paper. The final product stuns investigators. When I first saw the skull, I was amazed. It was, it was nothing like I was expecting. I would have thought it could be an actual skull. Dr. Eisenberg was able to examine the synthetic skull, now obviously with no tissue on it, and could do precise measurements. That's when the doctor makes a surprising discovery. The shape of the skull, the distance between the eye sockets, the distance between the front of the skull to the back of the skull, suggested to me that perhaps she wasn't necessarily an American black, but perhaps an African black. It's an important distinction, and one that will have a significant impact on the way the forensic artist goes about her work. It's not simply taking clay and laying it on the skull. Because certain ethnic regions have thicker skin in certain areas on their cheeks, on their jawbone, on the back of their head, for example. Recreating those genetic characteristics requires an ingenious sleight of hand. What you need to do is first, at predetermined anatomical landmarks, place what are called tissue depth markers. Cut to different depths for different portions of the face based on your ethnicity. With the markers in place, the forensic artist carefully lays clay to cover them. That's when the delicate work begins. Molding a nose and sculpting cheekbones. Creating lips, creating eyelids, creating eyebrows. Putting in the finishing touches that make a face a face. Finally, the face emerges. I was very hopeful that somehow this would be close. But is it that of Jane Doe? There's always still the question in the back of your mind, thinking, is this really what she looks like? 
two months after an unknown woman is found dismembered in the Wisconsin River, an innovative use of technology puts a face to investigators Jane Doe. There was something kind of warming about seeing our victim's face. And we just knew we had so much more work to do for her. But how good a likeness is this clay model? I was very hopeful that somehow this would be close. To increase the likelihood that someone will recognize her, the clay reconstruction is photographed with distinctly different looks. We decided that we we're going to put those photographs onto a poster. And distribute it to key public locations, including the chain of grocery stores from which the killer had obtained the plastic bags used to wrap the victim's body parts. We needed to get this out to as many people as we could. Over the next two months, the poster is seen by tens of thousands of people in Wisconsin and surrounding states. We tracked down many leads. But to investigators' growing frustration, every single one was ultimately eliminated. My feeling was that I, we just needed one person to see that clay reconstruction. Ultimately, the whole case was going to boil down to only one fruitful lead. Then, on a cold November morning in the nearby town of Westby, a woman is shopping in a grocery store. She was using the ATM. She happened to look up, and she saw the poster and the face of someone she recognizes. Then she read it, and she saw that it was a missing person and was the victim of a homicide. Horrified, the woman anonymously calls police. What's the address of She thought that it was actually a picture of her ex-husband's first cousin from Tanzania, Africa. The caller tells investigators that she believes the missing woman is Muvano Kupaza, we had a name that was being given to us, but we still didn't know if that was really Muvana Kupaza. It was one of the many leads, so we didn't want to put too much hope. The detectives checked the name in the public records. There was a Muvano Kupaza who lived in Madison, Wisconsin, which was approximately a half hour travel time from where the torso was located. She attended Wisconsin English as a second language school in Madison. Investigators show the poster to her classmates. Every one of them said, that looks like Movano. But the 25-year-old is rumored to have left Madison to return to her hometown in Tanzania. Now we have these pictures. People started to wonder, whoa, something here is not right. Her cousin Peter told her friends that Movano had traveled by bus to Iowa. To meet up with a former teacher friend of his from Tanzania. Peter said the two had arranged to then fly home together. Did the young woman's journey end in Africa or on the banks of the Wisconsin River? Muevano had come to America with big dreams. To advance herself, get education, and hopefully start her own life as an independent woman. She had been sponsored by her cousin, Peter Kupaza. She was new, she didn't know the place, so she was depending on her cousin to lead her into the prosperity. She trusted him that he would take care of her. Just as her parents had taken care of him after Peter lost his father at the age of eight. They were raised as almost like brother and sister, not just cousins. Is it possible that poor Movano fell prey to her killer after Peter dropped her off at the bus station? Certainly, we want to talk to Peter Kupaza. But first, they want to identify the woman who'd seen the poster and contacted police. There was a divorce proceeding in Dane County involving Peter Kupaza and his now ex-wife, Sherry Goss. Once we have the name Sherry Goss, we suspected that she was likely the anonymous caller. Curious about her desire for secrecy. Detective Welch and I immediately traveled to Westby to interview her. Goss admits to being the caller, but says she didn't want to be identified given her bitter and painful divorce from Peter. 
Sherry Goss told us that she worked as a missionary and had gone to Tanzania with her church group. Peter was her tutor for her to learn Swahili. Peter wanted to marry her. Sherry brought her new husband to the United States, and the couple settled in Madison. Peter Kupaza then asked to bring Muvano. Sherry did know a little bit of Swahili, so Sherry and Muvano got along, and Sherry tried to look after her as well as she could until the divorce and ultimate separation. But Sherry hasn't now seen Muvano in over a year. Sherry didn't know where she was living. Or whether she had left for Africa. She knows only that Movano looks like the girl on the poster. And she has a picture of Movano to prove it. Although the resemblance to the reconstructed model is uncanny. We don't know with absolute certainty that it is Movano. But what Sherry reveals about Peter and Movano's relationship may change the course of the entire investigation. She did not feel that he treated her as a relative. Detectives believe the mystery woman found in the Wisconsin River could be Muevano Kupaza. She had been brought over by her cousin, Peter Kupaza, who was Sherry Goss's ex-husband. For Sherry Goss, red flags started to go up shortly after Muevano's arrival. She was suspicious of Peter's attitude toward his young cousin. Peter would somewhat keep her in seclusion. Peter was uh, very controlling, very domineering, possessive of Mavano. She did not feel that he treated her as a relative. Then, Goss drops a bombshell. Sherry ultimately learned that Peter was sexually assaulting Mavano. Sherry Goss left Peter and filed for divorce, but Movano's situation worsened. Movano, in fact, had gotten pregnant by Peter. Sherry Goss was contacted by members of the Tanzanian community who advised her that Peter had taken Movano for an abortion. A shocked Sherry Goss attempted to help her. She did a follow-up visit with Planned Parenthood with Movano. Goss advised the young woman to return home. Under the circumstances, Muvano did not want to go back to Tanzania, given the fact that she had an abortion. She would not have been welcomed within her own people within her own village. A dark story that may have had an even darker ending. It started to point fingers at the person who had abused her. But before police can deal with Peter Kupaza, they must first prove beyond a doubt that the body is that of his young cousin. It was our goal to match our victim to Movano Kupaza if, in fact, it was her. If fingerprints taken from the victim's body are a match to those of Movano, investigators will have finally identified their mystery woman. But how to get prints from a missing person? The team hits on an idea. So we went looking for some documents that we knew Movano had touched at a health clinic. The very clinic Movano had gone to for her abortion. Initially, we didn't know if there were fingerprints on those documents. We had hoped there were. But it's a long shot. Many people besides Movano have handled them. When I obtained the documents, I wore gloves. I asked the staff who retrieved the documents to wear gloves. When forensic experts process the forms, fingerprints suddenly emerge. But will any of them prove a match to those of the murdered woman? We took the fingerprints to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. There are other cases pending before ours, but we're waiting with bated breath. We're very eager to hear the results. While they wait, investigators dig deeper. Trying to get information in advance of actually interviewing Peter. It was important for us to think about motivation. Perhaps the fact that Peter had learned Wavano had spoken out about his abuse. She went to someone in the community for help, and she revealed what was going on. She said Peter wanted to sleep with her. The abuse made even more shameful by the way in which their relationship is viewed in Tanzanian culture. Since Peter and Muivano were cousins, Peter would consider Muivano as his sister. And by our tradition, 
You don't mess up with your sister. And Peter knows his actions could have dire consequences for him. If people harbor animosity against what he did, he won't be safe. He couldn't risk sending her back to Tanzania. But keeping her here was becoming a burden. Peter had been evicted several times from residences. He had not paid his lease on his vehicle. And financially, she was becoming quite a drain on him. With no use for Movano, did Peter make a plan to coldly dispose of her? At the same time that Movano probably was still living with him, he actually was in communications with another young woman on the eastern seaboard trying to encourage her to come see him. In January of 2000, six months after the discovery of Jane Doe, the detectives get the call they've been waiting for. I was actually driving in my car. I, I remember exactly where I was. The fingerprints confirm it. The body is that of Movano Kupaza. Investigators have finally identified their mystery woman. I was so excited I nearly drove off the road. I was absolutely elated. We hit the ground running now. We had a face, and we now had the name to the face, and, and we were going to look for the person that killed her. But before the investigators question Peter Kupaza, they pay another visit to his ex-wife, Sherry Goss. This time, they bring with them the black bag found at the crime scene, the bag that had contained Muvano's torso. We actually showed her the duffel bag. Goss is visibly shocked. She told us that she had purchased a duffel bag just like that for Peter. Coincidence or irrefutable proof of a despicable crime? To find out, the detectives must finally come face to face with Peter Kupaza. My gut was telling me this man killed and dismembered Movano Kupaza. Investigators seeking the killer of Movano Kupaza have been led to the doorstep of her cousin, Peter. We had a search warrant in our possession at that time because if he was involved in the death, we couldn't rely on him consenting to a search. But Peter agrees to talk to the detectives. Peter seemed generally cooperative, somewhat nervous. He was questioned about Movano's whereabouts, and it was framed to him as it was a welfare check because people were concerned about where she might be. The detectives show Peter the facial reconstruction of the victim to gauge his reaction. We asked him, does this look like anybody you know? And he looked at it for uh, a very short time, and he thoughtfully said, no, it doesn't look like anybody I know. All of the African community were saying that looked exactly like Movano. And yet the person who knew her best declared that there was no way you could tell that that was Movano. That was a big red flag to both uh, Detective Welch and I. The first of many. Peter told us that Movano left Madison to return to Tanzania. That he, in fact, was the one who helped her to go. Peter provided her with $1,500 in cash. He said her plan was to go by bus to Iowa, then fly with a friend home to Africa. Last time he had said he saw her was at the bus stop in Madison. What's more, according to Peter. Movano's father assured Peter that Movano returned and that she was healthy and happy and living in Tanzania. Peter Kupaza has been caught in a bold-faced lie. Lies just reaffirm what our suspicions were, and he gave us many, many lies. Peter told us during this interview initially that Movano was never in this apartment. Later in the interview, that story changed a bit and that, well, she had never lived there, but she'd actually been there. She came to visit many times. She would come to do her laundry. And then again, it continued to change. She would only come over sometimes just to shower. But she actually had never lived there. But there's one thing Kupaza is clear about. He had said that there were no possessions of, of hers at his house. That's when detectives pull out their search warrant. Combing through the apartment, 
they are distressed at what they find. There were multiple belongings of Muvanos that were found, shoes, jewelry, bags that she would have used to pack to travel in. Most notably, her Bible that many people in the community said she wouldn't leave without. Investigators also find Muvanos' hymnal. As part of the culture for Tanzania, when they turn 13 or 14 years old, it's given to them as part of them becoming an adult in the church. She would have taken them with her as some of her most prized and personal belongings. Despite the evidence, Peter insists that Movano returned to Africa in April, but a letter addressed to her tells police otherwise. They were able to develop a fingerprint of Movano Kupaza just below the postmark, which was dated of June of 1999. But the most spine-chilling evidence against Peter Kupaza is yet to come. When you open the closet, on the floor was a collection of grocery bags from the same store that Movano's body had been packaged in. The detectives have seen and heard enough. We arrested Peter Kupaza at that time based on blatant untruths that he told us in the interview. He was arrested for the homicide and concealing the corpse of Movano Kupaza. But with the evidence against Kupaza largely circumstantial, investigators call in crime scene experts to search the apartment looking for proof of Peter's guilt. They pour over every inch of the bathroom. Found blood behind the baseboard right next to the bathtub. That blood was able to be DNA matched to Movano Kupaza. But a single drop of her blood is hardly evidence of her gruesome murder. Because this body had been dismembered, uh, there would have been a large amount of blood that would have had to have been dealt with. Had the killer in his cleanup left minute traces of his evil work behind, investigators hope the cadaver dog, Eagle, can live up to his name. The dog zeroes in on the bathroom and finds the blood investigators are looking for. Along the base of the toilet, bathtub stall, and along the base of the wall. In the kitchen. He indicated on a cutting board, two knives. Then he leads investigators to the closet. Eagle was alerting on the door pulls. So we speculated that Peter Kupaza may have had blood on his fingers when he went into the closet touched the door pulls to obtain the plastic bags. The dog finds still more traces on the tools used to clean up. We also took Eagle to the underground parking structure where Peter parked his car. He went directly to Peter Kupaza's vehicle and alerted on the trunk. Now we're certain that Peter Kupaza was involved in the death or at least the dismemberment of Movano Kupaza. But that may not be enough to keep him behind bars. We had no cause of death. We had no place of death. We had no date of death. Will the man police are sure is Movano's killer convince a jury to set him free? I did not do this. Six months after the body parts of Movano Kupaza are found floating in the Wisconsin River, her cousin Peter Kupaza is taken into custody. He was caught in several lies during the course of this interview. My gut was telling me this man killed and dismembered Movano Kupaza. On June 12, 2000, the trial of Peter Kupaza gets underway in a Sauk County courtroom. Among the spectators are Peter's ex-wife, Sherry Goss, and Movano's parents, who've come from Tanzania to watch the proceedings. They wanted to see the evidence for themselves to know what happened to their daughter, finally and forever. Their profound grief made worse by the fact that the person accused of killing Movano is a man they'd raised as their son. I would like to, for my parents to know that I didn't do this horrible act to my sister. The prosecution will be hard-pressed to prove otherwise. We had no place of death. We had no date of death. We had no cause of death. Much of our information is circumstantial evidence. 
and Kupaza's defense lawyers need only to show reasonable doubt. Can the prosecution team, despite the odds, convince a jury of Peter Kupaza's guilt? They begin by establishing Kupaza's means for killing, then skillfully dismembering Wovano's body. In Tanzania, every family raises a few animals. He would have been involved in part of that ritualistic preparation of the animals by butchering them. Part of that butchering includes disarticulating at the joints. As for his motive for killing his cousin, Peter Kupaza could no longer afford to keep Movano in the United States, but he couldn't really risk sending her back home either. But what about the third element, opportunity? The evidence that Movano frequented Peter's home provides the final pillar in the prosecution's case. We thought that he had killed Movano while she was in the shower and dismembered her there. In closing, the prosecution paints a picture of a man incapable of telling the truth. Peter Kupaza lied, and he built his lies on top of his lies upon more lies. Peter Kupaza really firmed up our case for us with those lies. And there's no reason to lie unless she had something to cover up. And he did. He had killed his cousin. To the end, Peter Kupaza denies it. I don't know what to say, but I would like to tell you today that I did not do this. But does the jury believe him? After nine hours of deliberation, they return with a verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Peter T. Kupaza, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide. Peter Kupaza is sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Movano. She was somebody that was never intended to be discovered or given justice, and yet she was. While Movano is mourned by her family back in Tanzania, it is her small community in Madison where she is finally laid to rest. When I remember Movano, what I most remember is her beautiful, quiet, shy smile. When she would smile, she could light up the room.